Hey everyone, it's Tommy Akan here with a Fox 10 News Now update. It is Super Bowl week, meaning we have a lot of Super Bowl related events and coverage. Next up is Super Bowl 49 football operations press conference straight from downtown. I'm going to go ahead and go there now. You can see live images from the conference room. It looks like media are awaiting the officials to take the stage at this press conference. Troy Vincent, who is Executive Vice President of Football Operations for the NFL will be speaking along with NFL Vice President of Officiating Dean Blandino and Bill Vinovich, who is a referee for Super Bowl 49. Mic check, mic check. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. Again, this is a mic check and just one minute warning. We're going to start momentarily. One, two, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Senora from the NFL office. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will have with us Troy Vincent, our Executive Vice President of Football Operations, Dean Blandino, our Vice President of Officiating, and Bill Vinovich, the referee for Super Bowl 49. And this is believed to be a Super Bowl first, a press conference for the referee and with the referee. So it's good to be breaking new ground at the Super Bowl. Uh, before we get to your questions, um, Troy will go over just a few areas of focus, and then Dean will have a, a quick opening statement as well. Uh, and then we'll get to your questions, and if you'd like to ask a question, just please raise your hand. Uh, a microphone will be brought to you, and then just please state your name and, and your affiliation. Thank you. Troy? Thanks, Mike. Uh, let me begin by just talking about a couple things that we focused on at the beginning of the football season, Dean and I, is really bringing forth clarity and consistency across all platforms, in particular officiating. Really wanted to be clear and clear about what the expectations were um, of the players on the field as we adjusted to some new rule changes. Talk a little bit about technology today. Any questions that you may have for that? Um, I, I welcome um, any thoughts or your comments as we introduce technology, and in particular, the Microsoft tablets. Um, it's, it was new, new technology to the players. Uh, we had some things that we needed to work through throughout the duration of the season, the glare, overheating, we're able to overcome some of those obstacles. And, and really, the players and the coaches, both in the booth and on the sidelines, they really adapted to technology. Uh, we, we introduced a, a, another element of that during the Pro Bowl with video replay uh, for, the, for the officials during, the, during, during replay time during the Pro Bowl, the underclassmen. Um, that was another point of emphasis um, for our department and, and really looking at how do we better inform underclassmen and their families as they begin thinking about making the most important decision in some of their cases in their lives, uh, forfeiting their last year of eligibility in college. Um, so working with the AFCA, all of the head coaches at the, the, high, uh, the, the collegiate level, uh, we were able to look 
and really de decrease uh, the number of underclassmen. They're actually making much more informed decisions. Um, health and safety of the game, we've been talking about it all year long. In light of all the other stuff that was happening off the field, um, we really had some significant achievements on the field. Players and coaches, and I must credit the players and coaches, they adopted, they adjusted. I started the, the off season with vis visiting maybe eight to 10 players, and we just talked about their style of play, really eliminating some, some the use, the impermissible use of the helmet, and we saw players adjust. We saw coaches teach a different style of technique, and we saw those numbers decline throughout the season. Developmental league, that's been a, or we would say academy, that's been a topic of discussions uh, since I uh, came into office. Uh, we'll continue to keep having discussions. Um, with our GM's competition committee. Um, and I've even engaged with the fans, uh, getting your perspective or with the fans, if there's an appetite um, for an academy or a developmental league. So we'll continue. We have a group internally that are working on that. We're looking at different facilities throughout the country. But it is something that uh, many of our coaches, many of our GM says, how do we further develop the, the athlete of the future? Um, and then lastly, officials. Um, just some of the, the rule changes that Dean and I, we've talked about during the duration of the season as we look at coming into the combines and some of our competition committee meetings, what do we need to adjust from re uh, reviewable plays um, to potentially the, redu to the reduction of the field goal, uh, introducing new proposals to, the, uh, to our game coming up this fall. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Mike. We had a successful 2014 season. Our accuracy was on par with last year, but we understand that the bar is set high and that we have to meet that standard. And we've got to work to achieve a greater level of consistency. That's the magic word when you talk to coaches and you talk to players, the competition committee. It's about consistency. We understand that mistakes are going to happen. We're not perfect. And we're keenly aware that every mistake that happens can have an effect on the momentum and ultimately the outcome of the game. So we're going to continue to work to mitigate those mistakes. There were many significant changes in 2014, major points of emphasis in the areas of downfield contact, and illegal hands to the face. I think the competition committee eliminated a lot of the gray area, which allowed our officials to apply a more consistent standard. Fouls were up significantly during the preseason. We expected that. But then as the coaches and the players adjusted throughout the course of the season, those numbers began to regulate. And I think they deserve the credit for that. Overall, fouls were up two per game. But game time was down over a minute and 44 seconds, which is the first time since 2008 that we've actually reduced game time from the previous season. And I think some of that can be contributed to two major advancements, innovations in the area of technology. One was our official-to-official -official communication, which for the first time allowed NFL officials to communicate wirelessly with each other. It helped us be more efficient in areas like penalty administration, less crew conferences, the ability to identify things, pre-snap coverages, keys. And then the second advancement was, was an instant replay. And we were able to consult with the referee from New York in real time for the first time and it made us more consistent and it made us more efficient. When you look at the percentage of overturns, reversals, that was down from 43% last year to 34% this year. Applying a standard of clear and obvious evidence to overturn the call. And our efficiency, we were down 12 seconds in terms of average delay per replay review. And, and I think these are some of the things that led us to reducing the overall game time. So again, feel like we had a successful season, but we're obviously committed to improving and because we understand where the bar is set. Thanks, Dean. Bill, what does it mean to be officiating in your first Super Bowl? It's a great honor. Um, obviously, we're competing against 17 great referees. And for me to be able to represent them is an extreme honor. Um, when I got the call from Dean, it was uh, very surreal and uh, very... Um, humble, I could say. Okay, uh, we'll start now with your questions. Uh, just raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you uh, right there in the front. Me first? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tim Twentyman with the Detroit Lions. Uh, 
Jim Caldwell after the season and had said that the technology is now in place where he would maybe like to see the human error element of the game uh, be taken out, maybe especially late in games. Has there been any early conversations with you guys about expanded use of replay as it comes to um, officiating calls or anything late in game like that? Absolutely. We've had discussions going back to last off season talking about expanding replay and adding to the list of reviewable plays. I think when you look at the evolution of replay and where it started, it, it was always based in fact. Did the football touch the ground? Did the foot touch the sideline? And we stayed away from the areas that involved subjective judgment. There's always judgment, but there's different levels of subjective judgment. And that was in the areas of pass interference, offensive holding. And I think it's something as the technology has improved and now we have high definition and super slow-mo and 4K, all of that technology, it begs the question, can we, can we eliminate some mistakes that happen during the game? And I think that's something that's going to be on the, uh, the agenda this offseason. We have several proposals from clubs to expand replay, and it'll be a, a topic for the competition committee to discuss. Thanks, Dean. Mike, go ahead. Hello, Fox Sports 1. Um, Pete Carroll today indicated at his press conference there's going to be a new signal for a player who reports as ineligible. Can you take us through that? And was that a result? There seemed to be some confusion about a player who didn't come out of the game in the uh, AFC Championship game. Sure. So the, the new signal, it's not really a new signal. This is something that, and Bill was involved in the first game, the Baltimore-New England game, when New England first presented that formation where they had basically a player with an eligible number reporting is ineligible, which is legal. You can, you can do that. The one you see more often is when you have a tackle 72 and he reports as an eligible receiver. So the signal is basically what occurred during the AFC championship game. Walt Anderson, our referee, he pointed at the player. It was 47. He waved his arms like an incomplete pass signal and then pointed at the player again while making an announcement. So that'll be the mechanic. It's what exactly what we did during the AFC championship game. Indianapolis, the defense could recognize that the player was ineligible. So that's what Bill will follow when we have the game on Sunday. I think, I think it was just in the conversation he may have misinterpreted that it was new. We actually did do it during the AFC championship game. And Mark? I, I also made the announcement, do not cover number 34. Which we won't do on Sunday, but we won't. No, no, we're <laughs> go ahead, Mark. <laughs> Mark. Mark Maskey from the Washington Post. Uh, you sort of started to talk about it, Dean, with the replay, but, but, and I know these will be conversations going forward with the competition committee. But as you sit here today, do you think there is a better com a, a better alternative to the Calvin Johnson rule? Do you think replay for pass interference can work? And also the third issue that's kind of come, is, is there a better alternative for the chain of custody of the footballs after they are inspected pregame? Three-part question. I'll start with the Calvin Johnson rule, or process of the catch. This is, this is not new. This is something the committee reviewed after that play in 2010, looked at a lot of tape. And I think when you look at the reason the rule is in place, it's for consistency, and it's also to eliminate – turnovers where you have a play in the middle of the field where the receiver makes uh, an unbelievable attempt to gain possession of the football. He's not touched. He lands. The ball comes out. That would be a catch and a fumble if we change the rule. And I think that's a concern. I think the rule is clear now. There's a bright line. It's certainly going to be discussed. We're going to look at a lot of tape. We, we capture catch, no catch plays throughout the season like we do other areas of, of interest. And I think the committee is going to go through an extensive review of film and decide whether they want to make a recommendation to change the rule or not. So that's something that we'll go through. Second question, uh, expanding replay for areas like pass interference. Again, that's a, it's a subjective call. It's not as simple as saying the football hit the ground or the foot stepped on the sideline. There's different levels there. Was there enough material restriction to prevent the receiver from making a catch? I don't know if the ability to watch it again and again will necessarily eliminate some of the mistakes that, that are made. I think that's something that uh, the officials on the field have to be able to officiate, and we're working to improve in that area, just like other areas. And, uh, and when you slow something down, it does change the standard, uh, especially when it comes to things like downfield contact. So that's a concern, but again, it's going to be on the table. It's going to be discussed. As far as the footballs go, we're reviewing our protocol. 
um, in terms of chain of custody, the officials do have the footballs up until about 10 minutes prior to kickoff, and then they're brought out to the field. So we're reviewing that protocol, and uh, and we'll certainly discuss it with the competition committee during during our meetings coming up in the next month, month and a half. Since, oh, oh, Mike, since yeah, Dean's on a roll, uh, <clears throat> maybe you share with the audience uh, about the protocol, football protocol this Sunday. I'm sure that's on everyone's mind if there's anything has changed from the protocol. So the Super Bowl is different from the regular season in a couple of ways when it comes to the footballs. We use, during the regular season, the teams will prepare 12 footballs. Each team will prepare 12 footballs, and then they will bring those footballs to the officials' locker room prior to the game to be inspected. For the Super Bowl, there's actually 54 footballs per team, so we have 108 footballs that we take custody of on Friday. The teams do practice with those footballs, they prepare them, and then we take custody of those footballs on Friday. We have them in, within our control, and then they're brought to the officials' locker room 30, three hours before kickoff on Sunday. We inspect them, we, we gauge them, and then basically approve or, or disapprove of, of the football. So that process, that's no different than any other Super Bowl. There will be some added security just because of the environment that we're in uh, for, for this game. But there's really no change in terms of the, uh, the protocol for, for the Super Bowl. Ben. Ben Volan from the Boston Globe here. Uh, we haven't heard from you since this uh, deflate gate started, so I have a couple questions for you. Um, have you determined whether Walt Anderson uh, properly inspected the footballs? Do you have any um, sort of proof of this other than just taking him for his word? And can you explain why the footballs were tested at halftime? Well, we did review what happened pregame. And from, from everything that, that – we reviewed and all the information we had is that the balls were properly tested and marked prior to the game. And then there was a, an issue that was brought up during the first half. Uh, a football came into question, and then the decision was made to test them at halftime. And, and now, you know, there's an, there's an investigation going on. I can't get into too many specifics, but really that's the, that's the, the chain of events that occurred during the, uh, during the course of the day. Balls were, I guess, inflated instead of using the backup footballs. Again, I believe that. Investigation. <laughs> Mr. Wells will have his report, and he will make that public. In the front. PBS News. All, any three of you. Uh, first question: On Sunday, game day, who has? Uh, it's a follow-up to what you said before. Who will have custody of, of the balls on game day Sunday? And, and uh, who will present the balls to the, the teams? Tony Medlin, who's the equipment manager for the Chicago Bears, who's been doing this for a long time, he has custody of the footballs. He takes control of the footballs on Friday, and, and then he will bring them to the officials' locker room prior to the game. They'll be tested. Tony will take possession back, and then we will, prior to kickoff, we will bring them out to the field and give them to the ball boys for, uh, for the game. Because of the environment we're in, though, there might be some changes. Can you tell us what some of those changes Just some might additional be? security measures uh, from Friday to when we take custody to when they get to the game on, on Sunday. Not quite Stanley Cup, but, but there'll be some additional measures. Will these balls, just because of the environment we're in, will they be retested at halftime to make sure no shenanigans have taken place? We'll, we'll just we'll plan accordingly, and, and if a situation comes up, we'll, we'll adjust. But... Uh, we're just going to go through the normal protocol. Kevin. Bill, uh, Kevin Acey from the San Diego Union Tribune, and sorry to not have continued this line of questioning. I wanted to talk about you and your reaction to being chosen for this game, and clearly it's not something that you would have thought would have been happening a few years ago. No. Um, a lot of you may know that um, I, I was off the By. Um, this guy is before, and fortunately, I had. All right, it looks like we're having some spotty service uh, getting the live feed in here from downtown. I will see what I can do. I'll make some calls, and hopefully, we will have a solution to this in just a second.
All right, our team over here is looking into what may have caused the technical difficulties right now. We were feeding that press conference live from downtown Phoenix from Super Bowl 49 Media Center. Um, it looks like uh, the camera may have needed some extra battery. I'm trying to figure out what exactly we are looking at right now. It looks like the camera is moving wherever it may be and a little bit of shakiness as you can see. In the meantime, while I figure that out, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys our 10-day forecast. So, you know, one of the big things that we are anticipating this weekend is rain. And I'm looking at this 10-day forecast now, and I'm seeing that there is a possibility of rain on Sunday as well. Now, many people would think that that would impact the Super Bowl. However, the Super Bowl is played indoors, and so I believe that uh, that won't cause too much of a problem. However, the Phoenix Open is also this week with the final round being played on Sunday. Obviously, the, if there is rain that day it could pose a problem um earlier today rick and i have gotten updated information as to what happened with that press conference so i don't know if you guys saw on our youtube page but we have an upcoming event at two o'clock that is a press conference featuring both katy perry and adina menzel they'll be talking about their upcoming super bowl performances this sunday so we'll be streaming that live here on fox 10 news now i've heard that both of our cameras that were at this event are now headed towards that event so it looks like that is the extent of our press conference coverage in regards to officiating the upcoming super bowl game so with that said, I will wrap up this broadcast and I will be back with you guys at 2 o'clock to bring you the press conference featuring Katy Perry and Adina Menzel. This has been a Fox 10 News Now update. As always, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Fox 10 Phoenix. That way you will stay in the loop with all of these great updates and all of these great live streams that we offer you here on our YouTube page. I'm Samia Khan. Thanks for watching.